all the kids for getting in, and it is, I'm just so grateful for all of you today. You're welcome to take out your handout for today's lesson, which is entitled The Anti-Authoritarian Jesus. Oh, it's a four-pager, and you're going to have a heart attack today. You're going to say, oh my gosh, this is going to be a two-hour sermon. It will not be. It will be a normal length. I'm only going to go over two of the four pages, okay? So be patient. This is important, though. Even though it's shorter than what it looks, and maybe it may not be as intimidating as it looks, I am really going to challenge you today in your thought process about your relationship with God, your understanding of sin, and your understanding of the law. Okay? That's what my plan is today. So today is a very heady lesson, a thought-filled lesson, one that really challenged me, and I hope is one that's going to really challenge you. So we're going to start again on the front page, and I know you might be having a hard time figuring that out, but the front page again is the one that says the anti-authoritarian Jesus. It has the gospel lesson on it. And for those falling online, Terry, do we have that linked up there for the, uh, no, we do not have the handout. Will we will get the handout later for you online if you would like to check it out later. There are some really meaty things for you on the sermon handout that I would like you to have because they're important for your personal devotional life about deciding between what is right, what is wrong, how to make those decisions in life. So let's take a look at the background of our lesson. We start in the Gospel of John, the 13th chapter. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, it, The time has come for the Son of Man to be enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives the glory because of the Son, he will give his own life to the Son, and will do so at once. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer, and as I told the Jewish leaders, you will also search for me, but you cannot come where I'm going. So now I am giving to you a new commandment that you would love each other just as I have loved you. You also ought to love one another, for your love for, you, you, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Let us pray. Bless this word today, God. Strengthen us with your presence. We invite you to come into our lives. May your spirit fall upon us. May we be inspired by this word and transformed by it. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now this lesson actually starts right in the middle of a story. And it's the story of Jesus' last meal with his disciples. And so we need to know a little bit of background to understand this lesson what is taking place here because there's some things that are applied in the lesson today that are not actually stated because we don't read that portion of the lesson so a little bit of background jesus and his disciples the 12 guys are sitting there in an upper room and they're there partaking of jesus last supper with his disciples and he breaks bread with them and on and on and, on. and before the supper takes place so jesus says something really incredible he washes the feet of the disciples now, why is it such a spectacular thing? It is a common thing when you go to a Jewish meal that somebody, i.e. a servant, washes your feet. Why is that important? Because I want you to take that image that you have of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper and get that out of your mind because that's not what it looked like. They were not sitting there at a table, sitting on chairs, sitting beside each other in the manner as depicted in the Last Supper that of his of his famous pain. Here's how it really happens. Their table was, oh, about knee height. You would come in, you would recline at the table on your left elbow. Why your left elbow? Because most people are right-handed. They eat with their right hand, right? And guess where your feet are? Well, you're just out of luck if you're left-handed. So guess where your feet are? Oh, in the face of the guy to your right. And you've got the face of the guy to your left in your face. Who wants to eat with somebody's stinky feet right in, your, right in your face? Sure, I don't. That's for sure. So that's why it was important for their feet to be cleaned at that point. Well, the 12 disciples are all looking at each other and saying, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Because again, it's always the lowest person who cleans the feet of everybody else. So guess what Jesus does? He cleans the feet of all the 12 disciples. They're like, oh, no, you can't do that, Jesus. Now that they see that Jesus is going to do it, he says, it is necessary. It is necessary that I clean your feet. Why? Because of what I'm going to tell you just a bit. And he's going to tell you that in a minute. We'll get to what he's going to tell them. Jesus then, what does he do? 
He then takes and breaks a piece of bread, he dips it in the wine, and he hands it to who? Judas. Now, you know, I've said this before, that's called the sup. And it is a sign in a meal of your best friend. It is a sign of friendship. Jesus handed to Judas, full well knowing what Judas was about to do, and then he dismisses Judas to go and do what he's going to do. And what's interesting is it says in the Bible the disciples have no clue what Judas is going to do. In fact, they think he's going out to maybe pay the bill for the upper room, or maybe get a turkey, or maybe get the entertainment for the night. Who knows? Whatever they think he's going to do, they certainly didn't realize that it was going to be to betray Jesus to death. So that's the background of our lesson and now we pick up with what we just read moments ago in the book of John, chapter 13. And Jesus says to his disciples, now that Ju Judas is gone, he says, it's time now for me to enter into the glory and for God to be glorified by what? his sacrifice of his life. And then he goes and tells his disciples that they will not be able to come to him with him on this journey. They're like, but we've been following you for the last three years. Where are you going? You can't come. You want to know why they can't come? Because Jesus is going to die. And let me tell you, Peter, moments ago, was just saying, well, Jesus, even though everybody else denies you, I will go and die with you. Oh, no, you weren't. Judas, our Je uh, Jesus did not want Peter to die that night. Why? Because Peter still had reasons to live. And here's the good news I have for you. So do you. God never asks you to give up your life for somebody else. That's not what the Bible asks you to do, and that's not what Jesus asks you to do. We all have things to do in this life, and the only death that has any meaning is the death of Jesus Christ. Your death for me is meaningless. I don't need you to die for me. You know what I need from you? The same thing you need from me. You need me to live for you. I need you to live for me. Okay? Number three. The third thing that Jesus does is he gives us a brand new commandment. What is that commandment? Love as I have loved you. What was his example again? Ah, now we get to that story why Jesus said it was necessary for me to clean their feet. The example of Jesus' love is the cleaning of the disciples' feet. And now they're starting to understand why that activity was so important and why Jesus said it was so necessary for him to clean their feet because it was the example of what true love is. The master serves the servant. That's how true love is expressed. Jesus is the anti-authoritarian. See, I know, we've got elections going on, we've got all these politicians going on, they all want you to serve them. Jesus wants to serve us. Okay? He's the authority of the world who submits to the servant. You laughing at me? I'll no, tell no, you. I was, I was just thinking. You know, I know. Trump, Trump watching somebody. That's feet. right. Can you imagine? <laughs> but that's exactly the point. Imagine. I know. We just said that as a joke, and I don't like to get political here. But imagine from an, any of these political uh, uh, presidential candidates watching any feet, and in particular Donald Trump. That's right. You can't imagine. This is what Jesus does. Jesus is higher and mightier than any of these folks, and he's sitting there watching the feet of the disciples. The master performs. The humiliating, humiliating task that nobody else is willing to do. And with one word, with one commandment, replaces the entire Old Testament commandments. All of the Old Testament laws. Love one another. The entire legal system. Now I need you to understand how profound a thing this is. Okay? That Jesus is asking us to love and no longer follow the Old Testament. Wouldn't it be nice? I don't know. If we had a book that told us everything we should know in life, everything we should do, and they answered all the life questions, well, according to the Bible, guess what? This book doesn't tell you the answer to every question you're going to face in life. And I know a lot of people disagree with me, but you've got to hear me out. This book will not give you every answer you need. It will not tell you the answer to every moral quandary or question. Why? Because Jesus trusts that you're going to be able to figure it out. Inspired by his love. We'll get back to that in a minute. But I'm going to say some things that you're going to really take some umbrage to in a minute. Because here's the thing. What Jesus asks us to do is not follow a dead law that's written in a book somewhere, but to love as he loved. So here's the problem with love. Love is often a very debatable thing as far as how you're best supposed to love other people. And the problem with love also is it cannot be legislated. 
cannot be enforced by the power of law. In fact, as soon as you take pen and put pen to paper and write the law, you shall love, it ceases to be love. Love is often circumstantial. So what's right in Boise, Idaho is not right in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh, I got a better example. I'm going to prove to you this. And what's right in Minneapolis, Minnesota is, uh, is not right here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So what I'm going to tell you why this is true, and I know this to be true. If you ever have the opportunity to drive in Minnesota, I lived in Minnesota for four and a half years, I think it was, four years or so. And in Minnesota, one of the things that you miss when you're driving a car that you will never hear or that you never hear in Minnesota that you do in Pennsylvania? Guess what it is? No. What do you hear in Minnesota, Ella, that you don't hear in Pittsburgh? Or you hear in Pittsburgh, but you don't hear in Minnesota? Honking of the horns. You will never hear a person honk the horn in Minnesota. Because it's considered, no, they have horns. <laughs> they consider it incredibly rude to honk your horn. So I remember the very first time somebody, we pulled up to a stop sign and somebody was sitting there a little pausing a little bit too long for my comfort and I beat the horn and they gave me the finger. You do not beep your horn at a person. It is considered bad etiquette in Minnesota. Okay? So it's considered wrong to beep horn in, in, in Minnesota. But in Pennsylvania, boy, you beep your horn everywhere, don't you? You just ha hammer that thing. Alright? So it's contextual. It depends on where you're at and the circumstances of life. And it's also true in terms of how we love each other. There was a man who wrote about how we need to learn each other's love language. And you need to do that with your spouses and with people who you're surrounded with in life. Because I want you to imagine your spouse comes home at night. And what's the first thing oftentimes you want to do? You want to go up and give them a hug, a kiss or whatever. Welcome home and isn't that great? Meanwhile, your spouse is sitting there looking in the kitchen to see if you got the dishes done. Okay? Because what really tells them that they're loved is that the dishes are out of the sink and back where they're supposed to be. You see, because people have different love languages. So for some people, it's emptying the dishwasher, making sure the dishes are done. For others, it's that hug and the kiss at the doorway. But for every single person, love takes a differing form. Go on to the second page. The back page of this one. This is why every single law, including every single law written in this book, with exceptional love, always falls short. Jesus hammered this out with the scribes and Pharisees many times. He said to them, in essence, this, this is my paraphrase, you can follow every single commandment in the Bible and still fall short of God's expectations of you. Why? Because the laws do not even scratch the surface of what God's true, true will for us is. So you can, you can say, well, I fulfill all the Ten Commandments. I've never killed anybody. Good for me, right? I don't know about any of you. I've never killed anybody. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. I fulfilled that commandment, right? Oh, no. I have not. Because there's more to the commandment, thou shalt not kill, than thou shalt not kill. It also is... Thou shalt take care of and love your neighbor and make sure that their livelihood is protected. Didn't hear that in the commandment, though, did you? But that's God's intention. And that's why a commandment written in black and white is so inflexible and so unable to communicate everything that we need to understand about who God is and what God wants us to do. The law is not flexible enough to address every need, every concern, every circumstance, or every context but love is able to change its course in a heartbeat, in a moment. And it's always able to meet the needs of the person right in front of you. Now do you understand why the love is so much far superior than the law? Let's go on. Number two. Many of us Christians, however, prefer submitting. It'd be so nice that do we prefer submitting to a dead law rather than living Christ. So we're going to keep going back and legislating the Bible. And looking at all the laws in the Old Testament commandments said, we got to live by these. They're not, they're not old. They're not abrogated by the presence of Jesus, Jesus Christ. And that's kind of true. If you love, you fulfill all the intentional law. But the problem is, if you just follow the written law, 
you miss the point of what Jesus really wants us to do. And it's easier to be told sometimes what to do than to have to figure it out. And so when you're faced with challenging difficulties in life, it's easier, uh, what, what happens is you get people, Christians, that start to argue about it and say, well, I think we should do this. I think we should. Well, you're wrong because the Bible says I believe it. That settles it. And they use the Bible as a club to smack you over the head. Has that ever happened to you? People have done that to me. I hate that. I despise that. I think it's wrong. Now, I have no problems with the first portion of that. The Bible says it. I believe it. I agree with that. But I've never heard somebody use that phrase in a loving manner. I've never heard somebody come up to me and say, you know what? The Bible says I should love you, and I just love you so much. I believe it. That just settles it. I just love you, dear. Nobody's ever used that phrase that way, have they? How do they use that? You're wrong. The Bible says I believe that settles it. You're an idiot. Shut up. That's how they use that phrase, right? Am I right? Okay. That is so not God. And that's so not the love of Jesus Christ. When we use that phrase in that way, that is the murderous spirit of Christian authoritarianism rearing its head. And that's not the way of God. Love dies with those words when we speak them in that way. That's not the way of Jesus. It's not the way of love. So this box, guess what? You don't have to listen to me preach this next box. It's for you to take home about that phrase. The Bible says, I believe it, that settles it. First of all, nobody actually believes that. They only believe that when they want to shut you up and they disagree with you. Okay, so you can go ahead and read some of those things, to, and I will prove to you why nobody actually believes what they just say when they say that phrase. But going on to the next page, that doesn't mean that I don't believe the Bible. It just means that I believe that the laws of the Bible are inflexible and in, in able, unable to communicate everything in every way that we are supposed to love each other. So the next page, it says the Bible is not wrong. Because after all, the Bible is the inspired word of God in written form. It is therefore normative, N-O-R-M-A-T-I-V-E. -E. If you don't know what that word means, it basically means it's for our benefit, but it's also for, um, it's also in our authority in our life. It tells us who we are supposed to believe, or everything we need to know, or what we need to know about God is normative. It informs our faith. That would be a better way to say it. But the Bible is not a book that's to be used to smack people over the head. Here's what the Bible is. The Bible is the story of our immaturity and our need for a law, for a time to guide us. It is also the story of how God sent Jesus to the world to love it. It is also the story of the anointing of the Holy Spirit to all who believe in Jesus Christ. It is also the story of the call on the Christian to Christian maturity so we no longer have to depend upon written legalisms for guidance and direction, but our ability to understand God's love and to give it freely. That's what this is. So if this is ever used as a club to shut you up, or if you ever use this as a club to shut other people up, you're using it wrongly. It's a story of how much God loves us and how you are to be inspired by this story to love others. That's what this book is all about. And this story will transform your life. So look at number three. Every written law, including even those in the Bible, suffer from severe limitations. No law can cover every context or individual. The biblical law was just a stopgap, a mentor until the time of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the laws of the Bible cannot be codified in a manner to address every single concern. We're on the one that has a nice little picture frame there. So what do we do with this lesson for today? And this is the last portion of the lesson for us. What do we do? What does this mean for us? When we think about all the quandaries that we're in today, all the difficult decisions that we have to make, uh, all of the moral things that take place in our lives or immoral things or how do we make decisions, what is moral, what is not moral, how we take make decisions, what is love and what is not loving. Our fallback position should never be, let's check the legalisms of the Bible and figure it out. Because you're not going to be able to figure out 
what you're supposed to do based on the legalisms of the Bible. Okay? Chances are very few of them apply to, oh, I don't know, uh, genetic engineering or testing or some of those types of things or difficult moral quandaries that sometimes we find ourselves in. The Bible is not an authoritarian book that tells what to do, how high to jump, where to go. The Bible is God's story of love that's meant to inspire you to love other people. That's how this Bible is supposed to be used. So you need to understand the radical nature of what Jesus has done this day. Jesus trusts you. Imagine that. Isn't that our goal as a parent? Our goal as a parent is to raise our children, to give them our values, and then let them go and make decisions for themselves. That's what God wants to do with us. If we're sitting here, keep running to him and saying, what commandment covers this one? What commandment covers this? Jesus is saying, I've given you everything you need to know. In my love for you, you can make decisions for yourself. Now, when you make decisions, you might fail sometimes. But here's the point of this. If you make decisions based on your love for God and how much God has loved you, chances are the decisions you will make will be correct. But if you try to follow the law... The law is not flexible enough to allow you to love appropriately, depending on the context, the person, and the circumstances. Jesus trusts that his love for us, he trusts us, that his love for us will inspire us to love as we have been loved. Because Christian morality is not based on a bunch of dead laws or inflexible, burdensome laws, even those written in the Old Testament. Our morality is based upon the love that God has for us. That's the foundation of Christian morality. Not legalisms, not the law, but the love that God has for us. That's the radical nature of Jesus. The foundation of Christianity is based on the morale. Our morality is Christ's devotion to us and for us, and our devotion and love for one another. And that's how we figure out what is right, what is wrong, how best to care, how best to love. We no longer live by the legalisms and laws even of the Old Testament Bible. The law was a fine governor while we're young, but it's now for us time to grow up. And we are called to live by the Spirit, by one law. What's the one law we're supposed to live by? Love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, your neighbor as yourself. I told you I gave you some extra things, tidbits here to take home with you. The last page, I'm not going to go through it all. I encourage you to take this home with you and use this for your personal devotion because it can be rather confusing some of the quandaries and things through which you are going to have to go through in your life to come. Many decisions you're going to have to make are going to be very difficult. They're going to call uh, to question some of your thought process about what is moral, what is not, how best to love, how best not to love. But I want you to use the Bible in this fashion, not as a club to beat people over the head to tell them what to do, but as a story of God's love, how much he cares for you. And we are, as a result, to be inspired by God's love, to care and love other people. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you call us to love, not to be dominated by the legalisms of the Bible and of the Old Testament. Those were fine for a time. And even those still today, certainly they can give us some inspiration. They're still your word. But even the laws of the Bible fall short of communicating the great depth of love that you have for us and the love that we are to have for each other. You don't call us just to avoid killing each other. You call us to care and love and protect the lives of our neighbors. You don't call us just to avoid committing adultery. You call us to adore our spouses, to have them at the center of our lives. You call us, God, to protect and care for our neighbor's property. You call us, God, to worship you and to be devoted to you. These things cannot be contained in any simple commandments. And so God inspires by the story of your love. Transform our hearts. We ask this all in Jesus' name.